complete and utter mayhem, but without any perceivable reason behind it. Bang and go, bang and go. What happened in this cockpit is almost impossible to understand, but yet I will now try to make sense of it because, as it turns out, I have a very personal connection to this story. Stay tuned. Around 01.30 in the morning on January the 24th, 2010, a Boeing 737-800 from Ethiopian Airlines arrived at Beirut International Airport in Lebanon. The flight had taken off from Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, earlier in the same evening, and the crew on board were now looking forward to finally finishing their duty, getting some food and then heading off to bed. So after the aircraft had parked at the gate, the two pilots waited until the last passengers had disembarked and then secured the aircraft down and left it for the night. They now needed to find somewhere to eat, which can be a little bit tricky when you're arriving late at night into a new place, and Beirut was new to them. Neither the captain nor the first officer had ever flown to this airport before, but at least the weather had been reasonably nice so far and the airport services were working really well. Now we don't know exactly where the crew ended up eating. Maybe they found a local restaurant or ate at their hotel. But that meal that they had will soon become very important. So who were these pilots then? Well, the captain was a 44-year-old Ethiopian citizen with just over 10,200 hours of total time. He had been working at Ethiopian Airlines for almost exactly 21 years on this day, but he had only been operating as a captain for about one and a half years, and just a couple of months on the Boeing 737-NG, meaning that he only had 188 hours on that type. During his early career, he had flown around 2,500 hours on various lighter aircraft, where he had been working with spraying crops, etc. And after joining Ethiopian, he had then flown on the Boeing 757, 767, the 737-200, the DHC-6, and as a captain on the Fokker 50, before finally ending up on the Boeing 737-800. This meant that he had a wide range of flying experience, and his training record was almost spotless, except for a single remark by one trainer, who had mentioned that he needed to concentrate more during recurrent training. According to his friends, family and colleagues, he was healthy, didn't drink or smoke, and was a nice and positive guy with no personality issues whatsoever. But he had been working very hard lately, with his record showing 99 hours flown during the previous 30 days and 236 hours in the preceding three months. Now, it's not uncommon for new captains on a type to get a quite hard roster due to seniority, etc., but he had received all legally required rest time and was also well within duty time limitations. Operating together with him on this evening was a young, 23-year-old Ethiopian first officer. He was quite new in his role and had graduated from Ethiopian Airlines' own training academy only about a year before. After that, he had been transferred directly into the Boeing 737-NG type rating training, from which he had graduated in August of 2009 and he had now flown a total of 673 hours, of which 350 were on the Boeing 737-800. Now, during his training, his instructors had been overwhelmingly positive about his performance, and he had been deemed as one of the strongest cadets in his class. The only negative comment entered into his training file was after one single simulator session, when one of his instructors had told him that he shouldn't interfere with pilot flying duties unnecessarily, and also not to ask irrelevant questions. Now, hearing something like that might of course be off-putting, and could potentially have made him a bit more passive as pilot monitoring, but since I have instructed hundreds of type rating cadets in my career, I also recognize these kind of instructor comments. They are normally given to high-performing students who might be working with a slightly weaker colleague and therefore ends up taking over in the session. It's normally designed to take the person down a peg in order to get the crew to be able to work better together going forward through the sessions. Now, that assessment seems to also be confirmed by several comments from captains who had actually flown with this first officer. They all said that his call-out and performance was like that of a senior first officer, who said what he needed to say when he was supposed to say it. He was also in generally good health, only smoked on festive occasions and had a pleasant personality. He loved his job and always took time to prepare properly before each flight. A good new first officer, in other words. Now, you might notice that I'm spending a little bit more time on describing the pilots here than I normally do, but 
There is a reason for that, I promise. Now, when it came to the company, Ethiopian Airlines is one of the best-run airlines in Africa and has won numerous awards. It was started back in 1945 by Emperor Haile Selassie together with TWA, and by the time of this flight, it was operating to over 50 destinations worldwide as well as to several domestic airports. It had a fully functioning safety management system, including flight data monitoring on their fleet, and kept their aircraft well maintained. And on top of that, they were also providing detailed crew resource management courses to all of their crews, which these two pilots had also taken part in. But despite their strong safety record, incidents like the one that you're about to see reminds us that aviation safety is a global challenge and something that we all should try to learn from. Take for example the aftermath of the two Boeing 77 MAX tragedies, who led to groundbreaking legal settlements and global scrutiny of the industry as a whole, and that's something that I will cover more about soon. When something huge like that happens, I turn to Ground News, my go-to app and website to easily get the full story from every angle. And as a long-term sponsor, they really help make my work possible. Regarding the Maxis, Boeing recently reached a settlement with the family of an Ethiopian Airlines victim, avoiding a federal civil trial. By settling out of court, Boeing admitted responsibility and paid out billions to the families of the victims. And when reading this on Ground News, you can access over 20 articles about it from sources worldwide. Comparing these perspectives offers a much more fair and clear view. For example, First Pose, a source backed by Indian billionaire Mukesh Ambani, focuses on Boeing's strategic legal moves, while French government-funded France 24 offers a more balanced account, emphasizing the emotional toll on the victims' families. You have all made it pretty clear to me that you are frustrated with the lack of context and abundance of sensationalisms found in mainstream media today, and Ground News is a great way of seeing beyond that. Something I personally find quite useful is this factuality rating. At a glance, it lets you decide how reliable a news source is based on subjective language found in their printed reporting and their timeliness of corrections. I can't recommend Ground News enough, so scan this QR code or go to ground.news slash mentorpilot to save 50% off unlimited access to the Vantage plan, which is the same plan that I use. Now, make sure that you use my link for their biggest discount of the year, whether you subscribe for yourself or send it as a gift. Thank you, Ground News. Now, let's continue. So, all in all, this was a well-trained crew, but maybe slightly inexperienced on the type. The airline had stipulated that a new captain, meaning someone with less than 300 hours on the type, like this captain had, could not fly with the first officer with less than 100 hours on type. But since this first officer had 350 hours, that restriction didn't apply. Anyway, on the following day, January the 24th, 2010, the pilots returned to the airport late in the evening and started getting ready to operate the return flight, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 409, back to Addis Ababa. Together with them were also five cabin crew and an in-flight safety officer who had been trained as an extra crew member and would blend in together with the passengers to provide help in case of any safety threat. The pilots started going through their pre-flight briefing material and could soon see that the weather was not going to be quite as nice on this evening. There were isolated cumulonimbus and thunderstorms forecasted to the southwest, northwest and east of Beirut airport, but over the field itself the weather was reasonably okay, with only light winds and a visibility of 8 kilometers. The rest of the flight looked good, and there were no no-tums affecting them, so after having reviewed the flight plans and decided on the final fuel, they briefed their cabin crew and proceeded out to watch the apron and their gleaming Boeing 737. Now, the aircraft was in a good technical condition, and the pilots were confident with it since they had already operated it on the previous night. And I understand how they felt, because I have also flown this exact same aircraft. Not the same type, this aircraft. You see, before it was sold to Ethiopian, it had been bought new by my employer, and when I read that final report, I had to take up my logbook and check. And sure enough, there it was. This just makes this story even more chilling for me, as I've been sitting in that very same chair, looking at those same instruments as these pilots were. Anyway, 
The first officer had likely been pilot flying on the previous flight the night before, so it was now the captain's turn. This meant that as they entered the cockpit, the captain checked through the technical logbook and verified that everything was okay, whilst the first officer just put his bag down and then went outside for his walk around. But before we get into the actual flight, we haven't mentioned how these two pilots were actually feeling. In the cockpit voice recorder transcript, we could see that when the recorder was started, the pilots were talking about the briefing material that they had received and tried to figure out which flight level that they had been filed on. But suddenly, the captain also said, oh, what was in the food we had? Was there weed in it or something? The first officer chuckled and asked, did you feel dizzy? To which the captain answered, oh, I couldn't sleep. And the first officer filled in with, well, me too. And that was then just followed with some laughter. Now, this might sound quite innocent, but I want you to remember this conversation, given what was soon about to happen. The captain continued to prepare for the departure, and as part of that, both pilots did the performance calculation together. This included determining the amount of thrust needed for takeoff, using something known as fixed D-rate, which will essentially reduce the thrust back to the minimum possible for a safe takeoff. And in this case, the minimum setting, 22k, was chosen. And after that, the V-speeds were determined based on the runway condition, temperature and weight. And last, but certainly not least, they decided on the stabilizer trim setting. Now, this will soon become important, so let me explain a little bit more about that before we continue. The stabilizer is the whole horizontal back wing of the aircraft, and it can be set to different angles for takeoff depending on the weight distribution and thrust used. If, for example, the aircraft is really front heavy, due to a lot of bags in the front hold, for example, well then the stabilizer will be set at a more nose up angle in order to make it easier for the pilots to rotate. Now the same is true with the lower thrust rating, since lower thrust will cause S of a nose up momentum from the undermounted engines and therefore requires more nose up trim. It is really important to both calculate this setting correctly and also setting it, since it could otherwise lead to problems with getting the aircraft airborne or in the other end of the spectrum lead to a tail strike. Now, after getting airborne, it's also important to keep the stabilizer trim setting updated, as doing that will make sure that the pilot flying doesn't need to pull or push much on the control wheel. Once the autopilot is engaged, it will then trim automatically, and you can see that happening by the two spinning trim wheels on each side of the thrust lever column. Now, according to the aircraft flight manual, AFM, the stabilizer trim setting for the configuration of this flight should have been 6.9 degrees pitch up. But curiously, according to the copy of the load sheet that the pilots left behind, they instead calculated it to be 5.26 units. Now, the actual performance calculation was not captured on the cockpit voice recorder, so we don't know how this mistake was made. But what was even more strange was that the stabilizer trim setting that the pilots actually selected was 5.9 degrees. Closer to what it should have been, but pretty far away from what they had calculated. Now, what this mistake would practically mean was that the aircraft was going to be heavier to rotate than normal, but it was still set within the allowed green takeoff range that the aircraft was allowed to use. Now, the trim scale on the 737 is famously quite crude and hard to get exact, but this was almost a full unit wrong, and the pilots should have noticed that. Now, the final report mentioned this as kind of a side note, but I think that this actually formed part of a pattern that might make what's about to happen a little bit easier to understand. Anyway, once the cabin crew had finished boarding the 82 passengers booked on the flight, the pilots asked them to close the doors, arm the slides, and get ready for departure. The last few items on the before start checklist was then completed, and at about 30 minutes past midnight, the aircraft started pushing back from its stand and also started its two CFM 56 engines. The first officer then requested taxi from the Beirut ground controller, and soon they were taxiing on their way out towards the holding point for runway 21. Now, during the taxi out, we pilots do several things, including the before takeoff checklist, which includes checking that the flaps are selected correctly, in this case to flaps 5, that the stabilizer trim is correctly set, which in this case it wasn't, but no one noticed that, and we also do a review of the departure that we have ahead of us. Now, these pilots did complete the checklist, but none of them discussed what they would do in regards to the many thunderstorms that were present around them. 
we never allow the aircraft to penetrate a red cell on the weather radar and in order to avoid that it's therefore really important to have a plan in case we need to ask for radar vectors of the departure to avoid those storm clouds. And the fact that this crew didn't discuss this is a bit peculiar and I actually think that this was a precursor to what was soon about to happen. It basically just seems like these pilots were not really on their A game this evening. So why was that then? Well, have you ever tried to work when you're not feeling very well? Maybe you've been overly tired or your stomach hurts or you're feeling queasy or even a bit dizzy? Well, if you have, you know that most of your mental capacity then gets severely degraded and that's a very human thing. If you're sick, the body will concentrate on that no matter how important other tasks might be and that's why we should stay at home and cure ourselves properly when that's the case. Now, there are no indications on the cockpit voice recorder or otherwise that these two pilots were feeling ill, except that discussion that they had about the meal that they had eaten on the previous day and how they hadn't been able to sleep properly. The final report went into quite a lot of details about how fatigue could have devastating effects on pilot performance, but something I don't think was enough explored was the captain's remark that he thought that there was something wrong with the food. Remember the words that he used? What was in the food that we had? Was there weed in it? But that's a very strange thing to say if you only couldn't sleep. Asking if there was weed in it and then discussing how dizzy it had made them feel indicates that there might have indeed been something wrong with the food, something that affected them more than just hindering their sleep. And the important thing to note here was that both of them had eaten this same food and they agreed that it had also affected them in very similar ways. If they were indeed feeling a bit off here, that could explain why they didn't pick up the incorrect stabilizer trim setting as well as the lack of deeper discussions regarding the surrounding weather on the way out. Now, that doesn't mean that they felt ill enough to call in sick or even to discuss it, but it was especially that comment about feeling dizzy that stood out to me when I read it. Anyway, the aircraft soon started approaching the holding point for runway 21 and were then told to switch over the radio frequency to Beirut Tower. The crew had previously been cleared to climb to 3000 feet and follow the LATEP 1 Delta departure after takeoff, and this would include a slight right turn after departure to pick up a 220 degree radial from the Calde VOR and then climb on that radial to 5000 feet before turning right up towards another VOR called Cheka. But as this aircraft was now taxiing out, the tower controller could see some thunderstorm activity on his radar scope in that area, and he therefore thought that it would be a good idea to clear flight 409 to just turn right to Cheka immediately after departure instead in order to avoid that weather. But it didn't initially check that with the departure controller. You see, in Beirut there is very high terrain to the south of the airport, and there are also several military areas in the southeast and east. This means that arrivals and departures could only really maneuver in the area to the north and northwest, which meant that all departures and arrivals needed to be closely coordinated in order to avoid conflicts. In any case, when the first officer called up the tower controller and advised that they were on taxiway Lima and getting close to the holding point, the controller cleared them to enter and line up runway 21 and to advise when they were ready for departure. The first officer read this back and as they entered the runway, the captain switched the weather radar on on his navigation display and the first officer selected terrain on his. He then confirmed that and the captain also selected a 10 nautical miles range on his EFIS control panel rather than the standard 40 miles that they normally use, which would make him able to see all of the closest weather in more detail. These were all signs that he was well aware about the weather that they now had in front of them, even though they hadn't discussed it during the taxi out. The first officer now advised the tower controller that they were ready for departure, and that prompted the controller to clear them for takeoff with an amended clearance to turn immediately right direct Cheka after departure. The first officer read this back, which prompted the captain to ask if the non-standard altitude clearance of 3000 feet was then still valid, which the first officer said that it was, but he also offered to call and verify that with the controller. Now, 
I'm giving you all of these details because they show that up until this point at least the crew was a well-functioning one who, despite having made a mistake with the trim, seemed to be in the loop with good situational awareness and a well-working cooperation between them. But that was soon about to change. At 36 minutes and 30 seconds past midnight, the captain moved the thrust levers forward to 40% and 1 and then called out stabilized, to which the first officer responded yes. The captain then pushed the toga buttons, causing the outer throttle to move the thrust levers forward into the 22k takeoff setting. And whilst that was happening, the first officer called out N1 heading select, toga, as well as takeoff thrust set, speed increasing. The mighty Boeing 737 now started accelerating quickly down the runway, and just a few seconds into the takeoff roll, some static could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder, as well as the captain calling out, Did you see that? But the first officer just replied, 80 knots, throttle hold, as they were now accelerating into the high speed regime of the takeoff, and he apparently hadn't seen anything of importance. Now we can't know for sure, but the captain likely just reacted to some lightning that he saw outside of his window here and nothing affecting the actual aircraft. At least there was no abnormal indications shown on the flight data recorder at this time. Seconds later, the aircraft had reached 145 knots and the first officer called out V1, rotate, and the captain started rotating the aircraft. It then took around 7 seconds to get airborne, which is quite normal, but after the rotation the captain had to keep back pressure on his controls in order to maintain the correct attitude. Remember, the stabilizer trim had not been correctly set and this was the result. Now, already here comes the very first indication that maybe not everything was the way it should with the captain. You see, any pilot who feels that the aircraft is not correctly trimmed will instinctively and immediately start trimming it. And on the 737, this is done with the help of an electronic trim switch on the left side of the captain's yoke, something that the captain should have been well used to. But even though that, that was the case, it took a further 20 seconds before the trim was moved at all, and when it was, he did so for less than a second, which meant that the trim only moved from 5.9 to 6.1 units, still far away from the 6.9 where it should have been, meaning that he had to continue to pull on his controls. For me, this is a possible sign that something was now starting to go wrong with the captain, but it would have been completely impossible to notice this for the first officer. Now, the autopilot could be engaged as low as 400 feet, according to Ethiopian's rules, but the captain instead kept on hand flying. He soon called out, Nav, uh, heading select rather, to get the first officer to engage a role mode for his flight directors to follow, and this fact the fact that he caught himself here and remembered that they had been given a late amendment to the clearance shows that he was still reasonably in the game. The first officer engaged, heading select, but at the same time the tower controller called them up and instructed them to turn right onto a heading of 315 degrees instead. He had just been told to do so by the departure controller, who had been less than impressed with his clearance for the flight to turn towards Cheka, since there were already several arrivals coming in from that direction. The first officer responded, uh, 315, roger, and then selected that value on the mode control panel, which immediately started to turn the flight directors on the captain's primary flight display, showing him how to turn. Now it's probably worth explaining a bit here about how the flight directors work on the 737-800. They consist of two magenta lines projected onto the primary flight display, and they move based on what the autopilot flight director system wants the aircraft to do. The horizontal line tells the pilots how to pitch in order to follow whatever climb, descend or altitude hold mode that is selected on the mode control panel. And the vertical line moves left or right to show how the aircraft needs to be turned in order to follow whatever roll mode that's being used. As a pilot, you just need to put the aircraft symbol bang in the middle of the cross of these two lines and the aircraft will do exactly what it's supposed to. Like following a program departure, or like in this case a heading, and also following the vertical profile. This is a very effective system, and it even starts reducing the pitch and roll commands in advance of reaching the selected values, in order to help the pilots maneuver smoothly. As long as the flight directors are flown accurately, they provide a huge help in reducing workload. Remember that. So the captain now started turning, and a few seconds later he called out N1, flaps 1 speed, uh, flaps up speed rather, to which the first officer responded, Roger. 
This was an instruction to wind up the speed on the mode control panel in order to facilitate an acceleration to retract the flaps. But again, the fact that the captain initially called for the wrong speed here could possibly be a sign of him starting to struggle. From the first officer's angle though, this still would have been impossible to identify since benign mistakes happen all the time and so far this flight was following the standard profile perfectly. The aircraft was now passing 1450 feet and was still out of trim so the captain had to constantly pull at the same time as he was now also turning. So seven seconds later he finally started trimming properly which meant that he could now release the back pressure but he still continued to fly it manually though. When the flaps up speed had been selected, the first officer called this out and as he was doing that the tower controller also called them up and transferred them over to the next controller on frequency 119.3. The first officer read the frequency back and entered it into the COM1 radio box, but before he could call up this new controller the captain asked him for flaps 1, which he quickly selected. During this time the aircraft was continuously accelerating and soon the speed trim system, which is an automatic speed stability augmentation system, started activating and trimmed the aircraft further back to 7.6 units. This is quite normal and it happens all the time, especially during this phase of flight when the aircraft is both changing speed and configuration, so none of the pilots would have reacted to this movement much. They were now passing 2,000 feet when the first officer called up Beirut Control who greeted them and instructed them to continue the climb to flight level 290 or 29,000 feet. The first officer read his back and entered it into the mode control panel. You see, the pilot monitoring has to do all of the inputs on the mode control panel as long as the pilot flying is hand flying. But as he was doing that, the first really serious signs that the captain was now starting to lose his footing suddenly appeared. At this point he was still turning and also trimming back even more, but he was also fast approaching the selected heading of 315 degrees. This meant that the flight directors started to move in the opposite direction, to the left, in order to trigger a smooth rollout of the turn. But the captain wasn't reacting to that at all, instead he just kept increasing the bank angle to the right. He now also called flaps up, which the first officer acknowledged and executed and at that same time the new controller called them up and told them uh, Sir, I suggest for you, due to weather, to follow heading 270 to be in the clear for 15 to 20 miles then go to Cheka and it's up to you, the heading. Because as all of this was going on the weather outside was clearly not good. There would have been a lot of returns on the captain's weather display and on top of this it was pitch black outside, likely only pierced by the occasional lightning and they were continuously flying inside of clouds. So it is possible that the captain was concentrating mainly on these outside conditions and therefore lost focus on his turn which also caused him to miss the heading. Stranger things have happened. And the first officer maybe didn't point this out because he was busy with the radio flap selections and updating the new clearance on the MCP, who knows. But that still doesn't explain what happened next. As the aircraft now passed the requested heading of 315 degrees, the bank angle had also been steadily increasing until it finally went beyond 35 degrees, triggering three consecutive bank angle warnings. And now some really strange things started happening. Because the captain now started trimming the aircraft nose up, while simultaneously also pushing the control column forward. Now that doesn't make any kind of sense to me, and in fact there is a function on the 737 designed specifically to stop trimming opposite to the movement on the control column. So the only way that he would have been able to do this would have been by releasing the pressure on the control column and then trimming. Or if the stabilizer trim override switch was somehow activated, but I doubt that. Anyway, the final report didn't clarify this, but however it happened, it was definitely counter to how any aircraft is supposed to be flown. And it would soon get worse. The speed at this point was 196 knots, which is the last time that he actually used the trim. After this there would be no more manual trim inputs, meaning that the aircraft now locked in that speed as the target that the pilots were trimming for. Since the bank angle warnings were still blaring, this would have likely been what the pilots were most concerned about, but curiously the first officer didn't call this out, something that he definitely should have done, especially when he saw that the captain wasn't immediately reacting to it. Instead the captain now called out 2-1 uh, say again 
indicating that he had heard the call from ITC, but couldn't remember what heading that he'd been told to turn to. So the first officer called up the controller again and asked, confirm heading 210? To which the controller replied, Ethiopian 409, sir, negative to proceed direct checkup. Turn left, flight heading 270. Now he probably saw that the aircraft was appearing to continue its turn to watch the VOR instead of following the clearance that he had just given them. And the captain reacted to this by asking, left heading 270? At the same time as the first officer read back the correct heading to air traffic control and then also set it on the mode control panel. Now the fact that the captain had to ask again, just after having heard the confirmation on the radio, is quite telling. This indicates that whatever was now happening was starting to really overwhelm him. His workload was clearly getting higher and higher, and his strange trim inputs had made it hard for him to execute even this relatively simple maneuver of reversing the turn direction. The first officer now called up 270 degrees set, and that suddenly caused the captain to turn the control wheel sharply over to the left, creating a rapid roll to first 45 degrees left bank and then a full 64 degrees, which obviously caused even more bank angle warnings just in the other direction. Now this behavior is pretty consistent with someone who is losing his instrument scan and therefore suddenly reacting when he realizes that he has overshot a commanded value. The way to fix that is by making sure that the aircraft is properly trimmed and then just roll the aircraft wings level to get back inside of the loop again and then continue the turn. Or just to follow the flight directors, which would have clearly shown him how to fly. But neither of these things happened. At this point, it's probably also worth explaining how we pilots define an aircraft upset, meaning an aircraft who is flying in a way that could become dangerous. An aircraft is said to be in an upset if one or more of the following parameters are exceeded. Pitch attitude greater than 25 degrees nose up, greater than 10 degrees nose down, bank angles greater than 45 degrees in either direction, or less than the above parameters but flying at an airspeed inappropriate for those conditions. If we find ourselves in an aircraft upset, the very first thing that we must do is to make sure that the aircraft isn't stalled, meaning that the wings are not producing lift in the way that they should due to a too high angle of attack. If it is stalled, we must get out of the stall first by lowering the angle of attack, effectively by pushing the yoke forward and thereby unloading the wings. After the stall has been solved and there is no more stick shaker, we then need to disconnect any automatics and apply a very strict set of recovery techniques, depending on if it's a nose high or nose low upset situation. Now both of those procedures aspire to achieve the same thing, a stable, unstalled aircraft flying safely. In a maneuver like that, it is also crucial that the pilot monitoring is involved, calling out any exceedances and verifying that all actions are completed correctly. And one more thing. This procedure also clearly stipulates that excessive use of trim, and especially rudder, can aggravate the upset and lead to a loss of control. The rudder, which is situated in the back of the vertical stabilizer, controls the aircraft around the yaw axis and doesn't require any pilot inputs during normal operations, except during crosswind takeoffs and landings and engine failures. Instead, the rudder is normally handled by the yaw damper, who provides turn coordination, among other things, and the problem with misusing the rudder is that it can both become very uncomfortable and also lead to secondary flight control effects. So for example, if you fly an aircraft straight ahead and you then suddenly push right rudder, this will cause a yaw to the right, which in turn will cause the left wing to move forward quicker than the right. That in combination with the fact that the left wing on a swept wing aircraft will now effectively be less swept compared to the right will lead to more lift on the left wing causing a roll over to the right. So not only will the aircraft be yawing, it will also be rolling and keep that in mind as we now get further into this flight. The captain was now overbanking the aircraft quite severely to the left, and in response to that, he first gave even more left aileron before finally starting to correct back to the right. But it didn't correct enough to properly reduce the bank. It is possible that he was now starting to get properly disoriented, and that the lack of outside references had just made this situation even worse. In cases like this, we pilots have to concentrate on and trust our primary flight display and instrument 
Because the inner ear and balance organs can cause all types of illusions and villas otherwise. The aircraft was now flying at a speed of 243 knots and was passing 4,320 feet. And since the left bank angle was still above 35 degrees, a new series of bank angle warnings now started blaring out in the cockpit. At time 0039 and 40 seconds, the captain could be heard saying, uh, OK, engage autopilot, but since he was still providing inputs on the controls, this was not possible. One of the requirements for autopilot engagement is that the aircraft is in trim with no pilot inputs. So what we normally do is to trim the aircraft out perfectly, then just release the controls the moment before engaging it. But the captain never did that here, which meant that the autopilot was never engaged, and it's very likely that the captain was feeling so out of the loop at this stage that he was just hoping that the autopilot would come in and take care of it. Which it likely also would have if he had managed to engage it. Now, while he was struggling with this, he also relaxed his forward push on the control wheel, causing the aircraft to start pitching up and also dropping the speed. Remember, it had been trimmed for a speed of around 195 knots at this point. Now, there was no reply from the first officer to the captain's call for the autopilot to be engaged, but he wouldn't have been able to engage it either, since the captain was still inputting on the controls. It's also possible that he didn't hear this call, because there was now a lot of heavy rain hitting the aircraft, so much in fact that it was picked up on the cockpit voice recorder. During this whole maneuver, the engines were continuously operating at or near takeoff thrust with the outer throttle still engaged, and the first officer kept being mysteriously quiet. The temperature outside was now below 10 degrees Celsius, in rain, meaning that the engine and the ice should have been activated, but this was not mentioned by anyone, nor was the after takeoff checklist, which should have been completed at this point. Now, none of that made any real difference to this flight, but it's yet another sign that the two pilots were now preoccupied with other things that they should have been. In any case, the captain eventually managed to get the left bank under control and return the aircraft to wings level on a heading of 204 degrees. The pitch was now 12 degrees nose up and continued to increase over the next few seconds, leading to the speed continuing to decrease. And at time 0039 and 46 seconds, a now slightly worried controller called the aircraft up and said, um, Ethiopian 409, follow heading 270, turn right heading 270. The first officer read this back once again, but was later also heard confirming it again to the captain, who apparently still didn't understand in which direction he was supposed to turn. And that was even though the flight directors were straight in front of him, giving him guidance of what to do. So what was actually going on here? Well, I have already mentioned that the captain seemed to be disoriented, but why was that and why wasn't the first officer calling out the overbanking and missed turns? Well, we can only speculate here, but the first officer was brand new, and even though he had been performing well with other captains and had received the required training, he likely would have never seen these type of maneuvers before. The associated g-forces in combination with the heavy rain and turbulence might have masked that the captain was struggling, so maybe he just thought that the captain was doing the best that he could under the circumstances. The captain, on the other hand, clearly had problems here, and given his background with flying light aircraft requiring a lot of handling skills, as well as his experience on the Boeing 757 and 767, which were quite similar to the 737, he should have been easily able to handle these benign maneuvers. The final report talks about possible fatigue from not having slept properly and having worked very hard for the last few months, but I have a feeling that there was more to it than that. My personal theory is that whatever food poisoning that these pilots had experienced was now affecting them physically and increasing whatever disorientation that the captain was feeling. That might have also possibly been affecting the first officer and his ability to monitor what was happening. But again, this is just my theory here. Now I guess that we should also remember that scolding that the first officer had gotten during his training about not interfering so much with the pilot flying. but he had not shown any tendency of not being able to speak up before this flight, so I find that to be a little bit of a long shot. Now, those of you who are in my Patreon crew, let's discuss this in our next Zoom hangout, and I would love to hear what the rest of you think in the comments below. In any case, this nightmare was still far from over. Since the pitch was now steadily increasing, without any recorded inputs on the controls to stop it, the aircraft had climbed to 7,250 feet, and the speed was now back at 159 knots and still decreasing. 
Now those of you who have followed my channel for a while knows what this means. The angle of attack was now increasing and approaching the critical value where the wings would soon not be able to continue to produce lift. A stall, in other words. Now, since the aircraft was still being hand flown, there were no protections available to force the nose down. But the speed trim system that I mentioned before now activated and trimmed forward in order to help the pilot to get the nose down. There would also have been loads of other warnings, like a yellow flashing speed box around the speed, buffet alert on the FMC CDU, the eyebrows appearing on the primary flight display, as well as the speed getting closer to the red and black barber's poles on the speed tape. But none of these warnings seemed to have been noticed by the pilots. They also weren't correcting their heading back towards 270 degrees, as the controller had asked them to do. Instead, the speed now dropped to 141 knots and the stick shaker activated. A sure sign of an impending stall. Now, whenever that happens, all pilots are trained to do one thing and one thing only. Execute the approach to stall and recovery maneuver. Now, that has been updated over the years, but essentially it includes hold the control column firmly, disengage any automatics, smoothly apply nose down elevator, roll in the shortest direction towards wings level, apply thrust as needed and verify that the speed brake is down. But in this case, the pitch instead just continued to increase until it reached a terrifying 38 degrees. Remember, the limit for an upset is 25 degrees. At the same time, a left roll had also started developing, likely because that wing may be stalled first, and it was now increasing towards 68 degrees, meaning that another set of bank angle warnings were triggered. This caused the captain to call out, what is that? And then repeated it in a louder voice, what is that? But there was no response from the first officer. This clearly shows that the captain was now so disoriented that he just couldn't figure out what was happening and desperately wanted some help. But the fact that he was inputting on the controls and also speaking might actually have impeded the first officer's willingness to intervene. You see, there is a lot of incapacitation training being done during a type certification training, but that's almost always done in the form of a full incapacitation, where the captain simulates a heart attack and becomes unconscious. Now that's pretty easy to diagnose, as we're trained that any non-response to two consecutive callouts could mean an incapacitation. But if the captain was clearly still working, was he really incapacitated? There is something known as subtle incapacitation, which is defined as a pilot still being able to input on the controls and speaking, but doing so erratically and in a manner not suitable for the situation. That's clearly what we have here, but that type of incapacitation is much harder to diagnose, and taking controls away from a much more senior colleague who looks like he's trying to solve the situation would have been very hard to do. Anyway, after a few seconds of this stalled left turn, and probably in response to these new bank angle warnings, the captain now turned his control wheel sharply to the right, and also started inputting right rudder, combined with a slight forward push on the control column. The nose of the aircraft therefore started dropping, meaning that the speed also finally started increasing, but the stick shaker was still active. The captain could now be heard saying, speed, but still without any further response from the first officer. Now those right inputs on both the aileron and rudder now also started having effect, and as the aircraft started returning towards wings level, the captain now called out, go around, four times in a quick succession. And to that, the first officer also did respond, roger, go around. But the aircraft was still stalled, and strangely, the captain now started momentarily pulling back on his yoke, causing the attitude to rise to 11 degrees pitch up, before then returning it back down towards the horizon. The thrust levers were also pushed forward and then returned back a few inches before the outer throttle was finally disconnected and the thrust levers were pushed forward into the stop so hard that a clonk could be heard on the CVR. So what we can see here is a flurry of different inputs, each of which is not consistent with the phase of flight nor the situation that the aircraft was in. But at least the nose of the aircraft was now coming down and the speed was increasing, so it looked like maybe the worst was now over. But it wasn't. The Beirut area controller, who had been looking at his radar screen and had only been able to see that the aircraft seemed to ignore his instruction to turn right, now called them back up again with a more stern instruction. Ethiopian 409, follow heading 270, sir. Follow heading 270, turn right heading 270 now. 
And it did so, because he could see that the aircraft was now heading straight toward the high terrain south of the airport. The first officer replied to him, now in a much more stressed tone, saying, Roger, Roger, and in the background, sound of heavy rain could still be heard. At time 0040 and 28 seconds, the stick shaker finally stopped, but the rapid roll back towards the right had now caused the captain to start inputting left aileron, likely to stop that roll. But as he did that, he also left the right rudder in, leading to the aircraft now flying with something known as cross controls, which is highly unusual during normal flight and can be very dangerous. Because remember what I told you about the secondary effects of using rudder? Yes, that right rudder that he was now using was counteracting the left aileron input, effectively masking its effect. Over the next 20 seconds, the speed initially kept increasing, and as it passed 195 knots, the speed trim system again activated and trimmed nose up in order to maintain that speed. The aircraft soon reached an altitude of 6,000 feet and a speed of 238 knots before the forward pressure on the control column was suddenly relaxed and the aircraft again started pitching up, still with cross controls maintained. So when the captain a few seconds later finally stopped pushing the rudder, that also stopped masking the aileron inputs that he was still inputting, causing the aircraft to once again roll rapidly over to the left. And since they were still pitching up, this was also associated with the speed continuing to wash off. The first officer must have now noticed the speed trend on his primary flight display, because he called out, the speed is dropping. And then, only seconds later, the uh, speed is going down. And for the first time, the captain now asked for the first officer to help him by saying, OK, try to do something. But it doesn't seem like the first officer understood that order, because he didn't do or suggest anything, least of all taking over the controls. The speed was now dropping through 200 knots, and the left bank had increased above 35 degrees, prompting yet another set of bank angle warnings. And this happened almost exactly at the same time as the next stick shaker came in. The captain responded like he had done the first time, by applying right aileron and right rudder. But since the wings were stalled, the left roll just kept continuing to increase, eventually reaching 75 degrees. Since what he was doing didn't seem to work, the captain now changed tactics and turned the control wheel over to the left while still maintaining right rudder. Now, obviously this wouldn't help, but the captain's responses to the situation now made very little sense at all. And the first officer remained silent. The captain now also started pulling back on his control column, the precise opposite of what you should do in a stall situation and as he did that, the aircraft reached its highest point of 9,000 feet, before it started falling. The air traffic controller now desperately called up the flight for a fourth time, saying, Ethiopian 409, Ethiopian 409, you're going to the mountain, turn right now to heading 270. But this time, there was no reply, only a three second long activation of the mic. Despite desperate attempts by the captain to stop the increasing left bank, the aircraft kept rolling over until it finally reached the highest recorded bank angle of 118 degrees, meaning partially upside down. Both aileron and rudder inputs to the right was now again recorded, which could have been an indication that the captain was trying to get the aircraft back to wings level. But this extreme bank angle had now also meant that the nose of the aircraft had dropped to minus 48 degrees, causing a terrifying spiral dive. Like I said before, the very first thing that you must do when dealing with an upset is to make sure that the aircraft isn't stalled, but that was clearly not being prioritized here. When the aircraft shot through 7,300 feet, the speed had built up to 228 knots and the left bank had actually reduced slightly to only 45 degrees. But now, the captain again turned his control wheel over to the left, neutralized the right rudder, and then pushed the left rudder. This obviously just made the spiral motion even stronger, with the pitch that had now dropped down to minus 63 degrees. The controls were soon moved right again, but the rudder was kept to the left, and the aircraft remained stalled until time 0041 and 22 seconds, when the angle of attack had finally reduced enough for the stick shaker to stop sounding. But since the nose of the aircraft was now pointing almost straight down, they were accelerating massively and were still very much in mortal danger. 
As they dove through 5,100 feet, the speed had risen to 283 knots and the captain was still sitting with cross controls, now also pushing the controls forward, further increasing the dive. At this point, he was clearly so disoriented that none of his inputs made any kind of sense. It is possible that the extreme attitudes made it hard for him to interpret the instruments that he had in front of him and that the G-forces might have also been playing havoc with his vestibulary system. But whatever was causing this mayhem was made further strange by the fact that his first officer was still not saying or doing anything. There's no question that he now must have known that whatever was happening to the aircraft was partially being caused by the captain, so his inactivity here cannot be properly explained. Now, it might be hard to believe, but it still would have been possible to save this aircraft here by applying the correct recovery technique, closing the truss levers and maybe also using some pitch-up trim. But, as I'm sure that you have guessed by now, this was not being done. Instead, that last push forward on the control wheel, together with the cross controls, sealed this aircraft's fate. A few seconds later, the overspeed warning clacker could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder, and the last recordings from the flight data recorder indicated a speed of 407 knots. That's 67 knots above the maximum allowed speed, and 7 knots above the max demonstrated structural dive speed. The pitch was still at minus 32 degrees at that point, with a left bank of 61.5 degrees and a wing loading of 3.75 g. An absolutely catastrophic combination as this aircraft passed 1,291 feet. Only two seconds later, a loud sound could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder, and we don't know for sure that could have been either the aircraft breaking up or hitting the water. But in any case, at time 0041 and 30 seconds, only five minutes after the captain had set takeoff thrust, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 409 crashed into the Mediterranean Sea and all 90 souls on board were immediately lost. Now, traffic in the area, as well as eyewitnesses on the ground, later said that they had seen an orange fireball over the sea around the time of the accident, which led the investigators to initially contemplate some type of explosion. But it's more likely that these people either saw lightning or the aircraft's landing lights illuminating the low clouds during the last few seconds of its dive. Air traffic control tried to contact the aircraft several times in the minutes following the accident, but when that was unsuccessful, they activated the emergency alarm and a huge search and rescue operation was started. Scattered debris together with some human remains were soon found floating on the sea surface, but due to the bad weather in the area, it would take quite a lot of time and a big international effort to finally find the wreckage on the sea floor. After that, both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder were also found, and with their help, the investigators were soon able to piece together the confusing and horrifying story that I've just told you. One of the pieces of debris had some black soot on it, which could indicate a fire, but this was quickly dismissed after the soot was properly identified. And none of the bodies on board showed any indication of explosives or fire damage. Unfortunately, it was not possible to do an autopsy on the two pilots, so we will never know how and if they were suffering from some kind of illness or food poisoning. But like I said in the beginning, these were two competent pilots with good training records who on this flight operated way below the standards that should have been expected from them. There was nothing technically wrong with the aircraft, and apart from some bad weather and turbulence, there was nothing that should have caused the kind of handling problems that the captain obviously experienced, and on top of that, there were also no signs of lightning strikes or wind shears that could have explained what happened. In the end, the final report found that the accident had been caused by the flight crew's mismanagement of the aircraft's altitude, attitude, speed and performance through the use of inconsistent control inputs, as well as their lack of communication and adherence to CRM principles. The investigators also found that the captain was likely suffering from some type of subtle incapacitation, and the first officer's reluctance to intervene or take over controls was seen as a very troublesome contributing factor to the accident. The recommendations included the need for improved CRM courses by Ethiopian Airlines, focusing on the importance to speak up if something was wrong and the dangers of subtle incapacitation. 
The pairing of two so relatively inexperienced pilots together were also criticized, and there were a few further notes regarding monitoring of pilots' performance and keeping of training notes. But on a more personal note, this accident really touched me quite deeply. It's super strange to know that a cockpit that I have been working in has ended up in pieces on the sea floor, and it really just drives home how important safety awareness, training and crew resource management really is. Now, I hope that you found this video interesting, and if you did, I hope that I have earned a subscription from you. Please also consider supporting me by supporting my sponsor by using the link here below, or to join my Patreon crew where we can discuss this accident further in our next Zoom hangout. Awesome. Have an absolutely fantastic day, watch these videos next, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.